I'm going to be taking a more streamlined approach to this video. Rather than breaking movement, general strategy, and boss moveset into their own segments, I'll be covering all of these elements in tandem as they apply to each scenario. I'll talk about each and every possible scenario that you can expect to see as they pop up. I'm hoping this approach will provide a more condensed and effective guide to this fight. Now, let's no hit Sage. The oldest and likely most popular strat in the book is to go plus 9 Twin Blades, hacking RTSR and Flint Ring, and kill Sage outright in 4 L1s. What allowed us to close in instantaneously just now was the RNG. Whenever Sage opens with the Crystal Rain attack, it will immediately track to the Fog Gate. Keep in mind though, this works only as the opening attack, and if the fight has not been previously activated. If he does this attack later in the fight, or if you've boned out and re-entered the Fog Gate, this rule does not apply. Other RNG can make the task of closing in more difficult. A good example of this is Soul Mass. To deal with this attack, you'll actually want to stay somewhat close to bait all the orbs out. I like to sort of offset myself to one side and slowly jog across his field of view. This allows you to easily cut across any of the slow-moving homing crystals that might follow the Soul Mass attack. If you get too far from Sage during Soul Mass, you might trigger a partial or staggered firing sequence. This can be awkward to deal with, especially if multiple slow-moving crystals are also in play. The third type of opener isn't as ideal as Crystal Hail, but can still allow you to close in immediately if maneuvered correctly. In this scenario, he'll begin firing his slow-moving crystals from the get-go. To immediately close in on this attack, make sure you're sprinting from the moment you trigger the fight. As you get a read on the attack, continue sprinting at him in a straight line, and make a slight cut to either side at the very end. You'll want to recover your stamina before going for your 4 L1s, as well as being prepared to deal with his next attack. Alternatively, you can let off the gas and recover some stamina just before he launches the first crystal. Roll through this crystal and you'll be in position. Be mindful of your timing when rolling in on these, so that you leave yourself plenty of margin to react to any follow-up attacks. Once you're in position, the only attacks that should really force you out are the Crystal Hail and Soul Mass, and even these can be interrupted if you recognize the wind-up in time and have the stamina to punish. If you do find yourself in a position where you have to dodge the Crystal Hail, this attack will track to your last location from the point that he throws it into the sky. Make sure to pick a spot that leaves plenty of room to run to the side of Sage, or less preferably, away. Roll away at about the time they're landing to create extra distance, if need be. Take care not to confuse this with the attack that shoots a straight trail of crystals along the ground. These two attacks have the same audio cue and initial wind-up. As long as you're jogging perpendicular to Sage's line of sight, you should be safe from this attack. In the case that he continues casting the slow-moving crystals, you can stand right up against his body, and these will pass over your head. One exception to this would be if he's on lower elevation than the player. If you somehow find yourself in this position, you can rotate around him as he continues to cast. In the case of the Flash Sword attack, you can roll directly into his body, or you can roll directly backwards and then immediately close back in. Rolling backwards can sometimes make it a bit easier to see his next move, though it can feel a bit precarious if there's a crystal in play right behind you. That being said, in hundreds of Sage attempts, I've never rolled backwards into one of these crystals, but if you want to take that with a grain of salt, I don't blame you. I would too. If he goes for the three-piece rapier attack, roll back from the initial swing and any follow-ups, and then close back in. As I indicated before, these attacks at worst should stall you for a bit, but should never force a retreat. And of course, the last thing he can do from this position is idle. Fortunately, idle punishes are quite safe in this fight. 
One final pointer I'd like to mention concerning these punishes. If you're punishing the slow-moving crystal attack, there's a window during which if you attack with an L1, it will raise your character model high enough to collide with this crystal, causing a hit. To avoid this, be sure to attack him while he's still casting, or a brief moment after this crystal has passed by. In theory, rotating around with the cast should help too. Another popular way to deal with Sage is to parry and repost his rapier attack and then unload with L1s. This can be appealing if you're taking the plus 9 route but don't wish to set up RTSR, or if you want a 1 cycle on either a plus 7 or a plus 4 route. If you're taking a standard plus 9 route with around 40 decks and Flynn's Ring, you can expect two L1s following the repose to kill Sage. Don't bother fire bundling, as it will not save you a hit and will simply waste materials. If you opt for the increasingly popular plus 4 route, you'll need to parry, bundle, repost, and then land 4 L1s. You'll need at least 39 decks to pull this off without rings. Even the intermediate plus 7 can kill Sage in 2 L1s following the repost, provided you have Flynn's ring and a bundle. Otherwise, anticipate a respectable 3. When going for a parry strat against Sage, you want to pay even more attention to all of his close-ranged attacks. This is typically limited to more homing crystals, the flash sword, or the rapier attack that you're trying to bait out. In the event you do get a crystal hail or a soul mass attack, there's one nifty trick you can keep up your sleeve. If you two-hand your shield, you can bash Sage with a forward R1. This will stun him out of the attack, but will not force a teleport. If you're going for a bare hand parry, the same thing can be done by simply kicking Sage. Otherwise, retreat from these attacks and find a new opportunity to close back in. When you're ready to land the parry on the rapier attack, you want to hit L2 at about the point his hand transitions from the back swing to the forward swing. Starting your L1 spam too early is an easy mistake to make when learning the strat. Pay attention to the way Sage moves as he's getting up, and look for a brief pause. Another trick I like to use is an audio cue. If you listen closely, you can hear his cloth swooshing as he stands up. You'll hear three swooshes followed by cessation of all sound. After these three swooshes have passed, you can begin attacking. The first swoosh is partly obscured by the end of the repose sound effect. Proper timing of this punish will afford you 4 L1s with twin blades, or 5 R1s with a straight sword. If you'd like to run a faster route than plus 9 with Flynn's ring, but don't wish to parry Sage, fear not, 2 cycle strats are a viable option. If running a plus 9 or a plus 7 Sage, get into position and hit him with 2 L1s. He'll teleport away to reappear at one of a handful of positions on the opposite side of the arena. Locate him here, get back into position, and finish him off. Though we will get into reading the crystal formations by the end of the video, it's not absolutely imperative that you be right on top of him as he reappears. If you're taking the plus 4 route and don't wish to parry, you'll need to hit him with 4 unbuffed L1s. With this strat, you have to be able to get a good read on his next spawn point, reach him, and finish him with 4 bundled L1s. There are 8 different places in which Sage can reappear after teleporting away. Based on the first cycle, you can immediately eliminate 3 of these. In fact, if you ignore specific formations entirely, Sage will always teleport to the opposite quadrant of the arena. This is general rule number one. From here, you can narrow down the respawn point to one or two positions off the bat. 
rule number two is that a sage in first phase will never appear on top of a crystal. I'll take a moment now to present some of the formations in aerial view. Keep in mind that some respawn points have more than one corresponding formation. It's a good idea to have a homeward bone equipped in case anything goes awry. This is true for any strat, really. When re-entering the arena, be mindful of the crystal trail attack, and be prepared to maneuver to the side to avoid it. In addition to all the typical twin blade methodology shown in the video, there are a handful of ways to approach Sage with an SL1 build that will guarantee you don't see Phase 2. The single parry and repost one cycle on Sage will work with a plus 7 raw broadsword, assuming you have Flynn's Ring and Bundles. This is without RTSR. With RTSR, you'll likely be able to pull this off at lower upgrade levels. Then again, if you have RTSR, you probably have at least plus 8. You can also opt for a two-cycle strategy, much like the one shown with plus four twin blades. In this case, you can use a plus nine raw broadsword with RTSR. Hit him with three R1s, he'll teleport away, find him at the new location, and finish him with bundled R1s. This method incorporates Flynn's Ring. If running without Flynn's Ring, a fourth R1 may be necessary in the first set. If running with Flynn's Ring, but no RTSR, you can do two sets of four bundled R1s. If you're still getting the hang of reading the crystal formations and don't want to risk pushing phase two, you can also use four R1s in the first set and five bundled R1s in the second set. On the other end of the SL1 spectrum, you could choose to run a plus four at this point in the game. In this case, Parry and repost once, but do not follow up. Get back into position and wait for another rapier attack. When you parry the second one, repost, and you should finish Sage in 5 R1s. If you use a bundle here for the repost and R1 spam, you can save one hit. And if you use Flynn's Ring for the entirety of the fight, you can save two hits. There are many more unconventional approaches, both for SL1 and leveled runs, and some that even incorporate no weapon upgrades. For instance, if you wanted access to Cathedral early in a Twin Blade run, you could opt to do this fight at plus three and base mercenary level. Such a fight might look something like this.
You could even take advantage of the dagger's increased critical damage and use it in tandem with something like a straight sword or the twin blades. And yet another way to deal with Sage is to use Bandit's Knife to land two riposts and kill with bleed props. The list of possibilities goes on from here. I hope you found this tutorial helpful. As always, feel free to comment down below or via DM on Discord as you see fit. Thanks for watching, and good luck with your runs.